We are in the book of First and Second Samuel. We're in the series in the summer, and it's going to take us five years uh, to go through the entire book of books of the Bible. Um, Part of the reason we did that was simply because we thought it would be good for us to begin to see the story of Scripture and the story of God unfold. Um, but I also understand that maybe a lot of us don't know just the bigger, broader story of how things are kind of laid out in the Bible and how we experience things. Because when we read books in the Old Testament, in particular when we read them in the beginning, they're dark, they're confusing, they're crazy, they're strange. And it's like you're just drilling way down into stuff. And it's a little confusing. So let me just kind of give you a quick overview. The Bible begins with creation, right? In Genesis, God creates the world and it's good. And then by chapter three of Genesis, everything has gone bad and we enter into the fall. And that's what we've been reading about, the fall. And you see this dark spiral of brokenness and rejection of God and the brokenness of the image that God has given us just kind of spiraling. And so what, that's why when we read Samuel or we read Judges or it's dark and seems hopeless. And then we get to last week where Ruth, where we take a deep breath because nobody was killed, right? It's, nobody dies in Ruth. I mean, people do, but nobody stabs anyone, and you know, there's no brutality in it. Um, but what you do is you hear in the fall, in the narrative of the Old Testament, you begin to hear this, this faint drumbeat going boom, boom, boom. And in fact, in Samuel... Chapter 2, or 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 through 16, you begin to hear this narrative that starts, and I'm just going to read the last part to you, of maybe there's a hope. Maybe there's someone who can fix this mess that we are spiraling out of control in. And so I just want to read to you verse 12, or actually verse 16, excuse me. God is speaking to David. Now, we'll get to who David is and all that, but right now, David's a king, and David is really kind of upset because he's in a nice house and God's not in a nice house. Like, and we'll, I'll explain that later. But God says, well, I'm not, you don't need to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. And this is what he says. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, it is impossible for David to have a kingdom that is established forever, right? Unless God becomes part of the line of David. That's the only way the kingdom can be established. And so the prophets and the nation of Israel, who are God's people that we're kind of following, begin to pick up this idea that a savior king is going to come and make everything new. And it all kind of points back to last week in Ruth, if you remember, Ruth in Bethlehem and Boaz, and they have a baby, and they're in the line of Jesus. Well, this little part, David is in the line of Ruth and Boaz, and Jesus is in the line of David. And this little promise to David is the thing that Israel holds on to and begins to, to look forward to, G, to a Messiah, a messianic savior, someone who's going to come and deliver them. And it's Jesus. And so Jesus comes in the New Testament and there's redemption. There's the cross. Jesus dies for our sins. He lives out a life you and I couldn't live. And he dies a death we can't die. And he rose from the dead. And he offers us an opportunity for restoration. Right? And so that's where you and I live now. Is that we live at, at, with this hope. Because at the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, there's this beautiful picture of how everything is made new. That God comes to earth and says, now my place is with man. There are no more tears. We sing this song, Revelation 21. We love it as a community because it says that at some point, God is going to restore all things. Okay? And so we look forward to that as we cling to Jesus, our Savior. So when we drill down into Samuel, is what we're going to do, and we begin to think about things in the Old Testament, we're drilling down into what we call the fall. We're drilling down into the darkness. And I hope, at some level, to bring some light to it for you and see, show you how it points to Jesus. So if you didn't know, 
First and second Samuel comes after Ruth, before Ruth is Judges. If you remember what I said about Judges, I said that at this time, the Israelites are in the promised land and they have this theme. Their theme is they do whatever they want, whenever they want, with whomever they want. And I tacked on for us, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, but they didn't tack that on. They just hurt anybody. Samuel comes after Ruth, and Israel begins to kind of establish itself. Now, here's the thing about Samuel. It says it's first and second Samuel. It's just Samuel. Just didn't have enough room, so they made two. Okay? Not enough space to write everything. So I'm just going to refer to it as Samuel. All right? And I will show you when we're in and out of uh, the two books. But before we get there, I want to talk about a passage from Genesis chapter 4, um, where Cain and Abel, who are the first children of Adam and Eve, there are these two men, they, they offer God an offering. And God is really happy with Abel's, and he accepts it, and he's not happy with Cain's. And Cain gets angry, and it says his countenance was down. And you've seen this in two-year-olds, right? You take their thing, and their countenance is down. This is where Cain is. His countenance is down. Um, and God says, well, hey, what's wrong with you? Why is your countenance down? And then he says to him, if you do what is right, you will, not, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So you're going to see this theme all the way through Samuel. You're going to see this theme all the way through the Bible, is that if you do what is right, you're going to find yourself in the way of God. If you do not do what is right you are going to find sin crouching at your door. Now, the picture of sin in the Hebrew is a monster that is uncontrollable, right? They're talking about your desires, your lusts. Your, the very base part of you is crouching in you to destroy you, and you must rule over it. As we look at the characters of Samuel I want to use this as the filter because you are going to see these men in particular as they live out life trying to rule their sin and failing. And we're going to see the impact of that. Now, the beginning of Samuel starts with this woman named Hannah and you heard her poem. Now, Hannah... Um, lived in an extremely dysfunctional family because she had, there were two wives and one guy and she didn't have any babies and the other wife, Paniah, I think is her name, had a bunch of children. And so the glory of a woman is her children in the Hebrew culture and she's got no glory. And so she is just distraught about this. She ends up praying about it, telling God that if she can have a child, that that child she will give back to God to serve him. And so God gives her a child, and she writes this poem. And in the poem, the reason that the poem is put at the very beginning of Samuel is it says, this is what's important to God. Now look at these people and how they interact with these ideas. So what this poem says is, is number one, that God puts down or opposes the proud. Okay. Number two, that he lifts up those who are humble, who have humility. And he pushes aside those who think it's all about themselves, that it's all about them, right? She opens the poem with it being about God. So I put this question up here, why your life doesn't work? Because this is the question of the main characters of Samuel. Why isn't my life working? And here's the thing that I want to tell you. So if you don't even remember anything about Samuel, I want you to remember this. The reason that your life doesn't work, so the reason that you're wrestling with things within your, your parenting and with your family and with, at your work and why you're wrestling with your boss or your, you've got all these issues with your finances, I mean, I can go on and on. The things in your life that you're saying, ah, they don't, they don't work, here's why you're struggling with them. You are proud, you don't have any humility, and... You think it's all about you, right? You tell your story with you as the center. Now, 
You might be saying, like, wait a minute, Eric, lots of us have had hard stories. Some of us are struggling with mental illness. We've got all these different things. Yeah, and they make things tough because you live in a broken world. But it still boils down to this. That the things that you are wrestling with in life have to do with your pride. Have to do with your lack of humility and have to do with the fact that you think it's about you and not about God. Now, I know that sounds a little harsh, and I will, I promise, soften that a little. But I want you to chew on that for a moment. Okay. Now, just so you understand what humility is before we move on, humility is not being somebody uh, who just kind of grovels on the ground all the time. Somebody who is humble is the best example, and I kind of geeked out on this Hebrew word, and we've kind of lost the meaning of it, but we do know that the idea is that you sit down in the face of somebody who is less than you, okay? So you, humility is walking into a room knowing you're better looking, you have more charisma, you are, you're wise in some other way, like all the outward value systems, right? The things that make us valuable, that have made us valuable from the beginning of time, right? Not really, but the things that we think make us valuable. And saying, I'm not going to use those against you. In fact, I'm going to defer to you even though you have less than I do, right? So it's being willing to not take the things that you have and oppress people with them. That is what humility is. It's a willingness to not use the things you have to oppress others, to make people look at you. Now, let's get into Samuel. So, Samuel opened up with Hannah, and with Hannah having Samuel as a baby, that's who she has as a child. But the book actually starts out with a character that's not Samuel, not King Saul, and not King David. That's, it's God. So Samuel's still a baby, and I'm going to, you know what, I want to talk to you about that later, I'm going to skip that. Anyway, God's the first character. We'll talk about what God does. We get to Samuel. Samuel is a, is a really good prophet. He grows up, and uh, he does every single thing that the prophet or the judges don't do in Judges. Those 12 judges we talked about, he's, he hears God, he speaks about God, he does what's right, everything is good, and, and he's kind to the people. And he doesn't, he understands God's character. But the people are like, hey, we need a king. Things don't seem seem unstable. And so Samuel goes to God and says, hey, they need a king. God's like, okay, give it to them, but tell them this, that this king's going to take their their men. This king is going to, you know, take their their, their daughters as wives. He's going to oppress them. And when they cry out to me, I'm not going to listen to them because they get what they deserve, right? They're being oppressed by the king that they asked for, right? So he anoints a guy named Saul. Now Saul is a good-looking, tall man who God picks. God says to Samuel, anoint Saul. They meet up because Saul's looking for some donkeys. And they, they meet up and, and he's like, okay. I, I feel bad for Saul because Saul doesn't, I don't think, really wants to be king. But he has some major character flaws. And as he's king, things go haywire. And so... God takes the kingdom away from him and gives it to somebody else, King David. So in the narrative of Samuel, you have Samuel doing stuff, and then you have Saul coming into power, and he wins some wars. But then he starts descending while God has anointed King David, and King David is ascending. And what happens is Saul gets very angry at David and starts chasing David around and wants to kill him. And it's kind of, it's a crazy book. I mean, I can't really tell you all of it because it's 58 chapters long. I'm trying to tell it to you in like 50 minutes. Hopefully, I'll do it in that. Um, But King David eventually takes the throne. He refuses to kill Saul because he believes Saul is God's anointed until God takes Saul away. And so then King David eventually becomes king when Saul dies. And David does a great job. And David brings peace, and he takes the city of Jerusalem, and he calls it Zion, and he gives them a capital, and Israel is at peace. He's like the King Arthur of the Old Testament. Um, He does everything he's supposed to, and then he just majorly fails. And when he fails, 
Everything starts going downhill. Um, his, his son rapes his daughter, then his other son kills his son, and then his son is trying to take his throne and chasing him all around, and then he gets killed by a branch because he has long, beautiful hair, and it gets hooked up there, and somebody else stabs him. It, it, it's kind of, as again, you know, to steal somebody else's thing. It, it's still Game of Thrones. We're still playing out Game of Thrones in the Old Testament. It's crazy. But here are our main characters. God, Samuel, Saul, David. That's who the story's about. Now, there are other cool guys that should have had books, like Jonathan. He was really awesome. Never seemed to do anything wrong. The nicest, kindest person. He's like the guy you're like, why don't you get to win? Like, why are you not king? Right? But God's like, no, that's not part of my plan. There, there, there's lots of different women who are, you know, Abigail, who's pretty amazing and wise woman. She doesn't get too much play either. These are the four main characters. God. So let's start with God. In the beginning of Samuel, there is the hot potato arc, which is one of my favorite parts of Samuel. It starts out like this. Before Samuel is, is grown and is a judge of Israel, the Israelites go to war with the bad guys, the Philistines. It seems the Philistines become more and more the main opponent, right? And so they're fighting the Philistines, and they lose 4,000 men. And they're like, oh man, Like, we didn't have God with us. We need to go get the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, now, I don't have time to explain the Ark of the Covenant, but it is a box with some angels on it, right? And it's really the footstool of God is how they understand it. So when they go to war, and it's got two poles in it, God is walking with them. That's the idea. So when they have this uh, the Ark of the Covenant with them. So they take the Ark of the Covenant, they go back to battle, and the Philistines win again and take the Ark of the Covenant. And so they're all like, whoa, we got the Israelites' big, important box. So they put the big, important box inside their temple, and they go to bed. And they wake up, and their statue has fallen over. And they're like, oh, that's weird. Maybe something happened to him. Well, they put up their idol again, and they go back to bed, and he's fallen over again. And on top of that, a plague starts to break out. So they're like, we don't want this box. So they send it to the next town, and there's a plague. And so, like, we don't want this box, and so they send it to the next town. Finally, they're like, we got to get rid of the box. So they put it on a cart and send a bunch of gifts, and they give it back to the Israelites. You take the box. Here's the announcement that God is making, and this is what I love about the Old Testament. Whoever is writing the book, whoever writes it, Moses and others who are writing it, they have no problem writing all the embarrassing parts. In fact, it's utterly embarrassing to be an Israelite, and yet they write it down. It's utterly embarrassing to be us. We did the opposite of what God told us to do. At the very beginning, so what God is saying here is, look, you don't need a king. You don't need a judge because I'm your king and I'm your judge. But on top of that, I don't need you to win battles. You can't manipulate me. And this is important because it links back to Joshua. I don't know if you remember, but when Joshua goes to take Uh, Jericho, he goes out in the morning and he sees this warrior, and the warrior is standing there. He's like, hey, which side are you on? And literally in the Hebrew, it says no. Other translations say, I'm not on any side. But the Hebrew is just no. I'm on my side. And that's a very important thing, uh, theme within the book of the Old Testament, is that it's not Israel who's the good guys and the Philistines who are the bad guys. It's whoever decides to be with God is where the blessing is going to happen, where the success is going to happen. But if you decide to defer from that, God's not going to go over here and be like, oh, I'll kill some Philistines for you because you're, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Right? So that's the theme that happens here. And at the beginning of Samuel, God is saying, all, the writer is basically saying, God told us, we don't need a king. We don't even need Samuel as a judge. But we decided to take all of that anyway and not follow God. So I want to talk about, I just want to do a character study of each one of these people because and tell you a little bit about who they are and show you how sin was crouching at their door and how they ended up submitting to it. Okay? So Samuel is, like I said, one of the best judges ever. In fact, he's, he's legendary and he does a great job. He does an amazing job, and he wins battles, and he judges rightly, and he's super wise. But like any older person, he decides he wants to retire. 
And he does, and he decides to appoint his children as the people who are going to succeed him, right? And this is what it says about his children in 1 Samuel 8, 3. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Right. Now, I don't know if it was bad parenting that made this happen that he didn't pass on his ways. But I do know as somebody who is a pastor who has children, if they were like, hey, I want to I wanna take your place, Dad, when I grow up, I, wanna, I might try to pull some strings, use whatever influence I have. Can you imagine my two children running the church? Dad, you know, Ashton and Elliot. That would be awesome. I'm going to put them forward at any opportunity in any elder meeting. Oh, are we going to vote on Ashton and Elliot as the rulers of the, of the village? Like, I understand that desire because it looks good. Man, I would feel really proud and like I did a great job if my children took my place. Now, here's the interesting thing about Samuel. Samuel asks God about everything from the moment he's little till he gets older, and we'll see this even more. He did not ask God about this. He just did it. <laughs> he just put his children in, and it turns out not to go very well. Now, here, I think, is an insight into who Samuel is and an insight into who we are. When Samuel, well, first, when Samuel goes to anoint um, Saul. Saul is tall and beautiful and handsome, right? Like you pick the movie star that you like. That's who he is. And Samuel, you can tell in the subtext, is pretty impressed with Saul at the beginning. Now things don't work out for Saul, and so God sends Samuel to Jesse in the town of Bethlehem to anoint one of his sons as king. And he sees the oldest appear first, right? And he thinks, this must be the king. He's tall, he's handsome. And, but 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This is the way you and I operate. Right? We operate today on Sunday. I guarantee you, you have a subroutine in your brain that judged at least a third of the people in the room, right? You judge them on appearance, where they kind of fit in the status, right? We are constantly valuing people by their appearance, their charisma, the perceived power they have. But here's the reality. We are constantly judging ourselves that way. And we find our value that way. And we understand where we fit. And we kind of dictate our life. And what turns out, we don't, we're just sitting with Samuel. And we don't realize that God is actually judging the heart. God is actually judging what's going on in the heart. And that we're invited into that. And it's so countercultural for us. It feels difficult for us. But it's an invitation into humility because what happens is, is you're constantly ranking where you're at and understanding who you are by these things, by the appearance of man and by what they seem to have to offer. And you are like, well, that person's really charismatic. I'd like to be with them. Like, so you, if you can't be that person, you want to be with them, right? We have a difficult time embracing that. And so did Samuel. Even in, And Samuel is an awesome guy. And yet also Samuel had this issue. Well, here's the thing. At this moment in 1 Samuel 8.3 is the moment that Israel asks Samuel for a king. Now, I don't think it's the whole reason why they ask is that his kids weren't doing a good job, but I bet you it had an impact. If the rulers are taking bribes and not judging in a just way, that makes a whole nation insecure. And people who are insecure are willing to invite more rule over them so that they can be secure, right? And so his children and his sin led partly to Israel asking for a king. Now, we go to Saul. Saul's the next character, and Samuel doesn't get to retire, by the way, because of all of this. He has to keep working. Um, so, I always loved Saul as a kid. Because I'm like, Saul doesn't want to be king. 
it's all, he's just kind of fell into this, got anointed. And here's the evidence of this. 1 Samuel 10, 22b. And here's how you see Samuel talks to God. Uh, they're going to inaugurate and anoint Saul as king, and they can't find him. Just like you can't find your keys. It's, and so Samuel literally says to God, where is Saul? And God says he has hidden himself among the supplies, I believe. Uh, so they get him, they drag him out, and, they, and he becomes king. Now, you will see that the thing that's there to devour Saul is his fear. He is constantly afraid. Right? And, and here's the thing, just to go off on a side note, that when you and I, when you think about spirituality and the ability to hear God and feel connected to God, I want to argue to you that it has a lot to do with your emotional health, okay? Think about what it says in Philippians chapter 4 where it says, be anxious for nothing. And I'm going to butcher this, but, but it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and petition and giving thanks, ask, offer your supplication, offer your request to God. So be anxious for nothing, engage God. And what it says is that the peace of Christ will guard your hearts and your minds, the way that you and I are able to actually be connected to God, to hear God, to understand who God is, is when you and I are not being ruled by anxiety, when we are not being ruled by fear. And the invitation from Paul, the invitation from Jesus, is to offer all of your anxiety and all of your fear with an understanding that the peace of God will do what? It will guard the very internal parts of you, your mind, the way you think, and your heart. So, the thing that devours Saul is his anxiety and his fear. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul heads off to fight the Philistines, and the Philistines are pressing in on them. And Samuel has basically said, look, don't do anything before I come and do the sacrifice. But the men are starting to leave because they're afraid they're going to die, and the Philistines are going to kill them. And so, Saul decides to do the burnt offering himself. And he knows he's not supposed to do that. So then, because Samuel's not showing up when he said he would, as soon as the burnt offering is done, Samuel shows up. And you know how this works. When you choose to disobey God, as soon as you're finishing disobeying, God will show up. That's how it works. And Samuel shows up and says, What have you done? Samuel asked. And Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattered and you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord and your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, speaking of David, and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commands. Okay, so at this moment, when, David, or when Saul is consumed by his fear, God removes his throne because of his disobedience. The thing that's the sin that's crouching to devour him is the fact that he is consumed by his anxieties and his fears. Whereas Samuel's is that he's worried about what people will think about him, and he puts a lot of value on people's outward presentation. Now we get to David. And as I said, David is a, a pretty interesting king. When he's anointed, he, you know, he famously kills Goliath, right? Which is the famous one with a slingshot, and he beats the giant, and that's great. And he becomes more and more famous. Um, but he never chooses to kill Saul, even though he has opportunities to kill Saul. In fact, he feels so guilty at one point when he sneaks into Saul's camp and they cut off a little bit of his robe, he has this horrible anxiety issue about the fact that he even touched God's anointed, which is extremely different than Saul. The, David honors what God is doing and is willing to say, okay, I'm not in control, you are, you will place me in the throne that you promised me when you want to do it. Not when I want to do it. And so he waits until Saul dies and is beheaded. And even then, at the beginning of 2 Samuel, he weeps over it and he writes a poem. But here's the thing about David, and you will see this in the subtext if you read his story, and I, I would suggest you read both First and Second Samuel. But 
he's impulsive. There is moment after moment where he's just impulsive. And he has a hard time in controlling his impulsiveness. Right? And so we get to 2 Samuel, and everything is actually, 2 Samuel chapter 11, everything is actually going well. He's established a kingdom. There's peace. In fact, he takes in the rest of what's left of Saul's family and makes them his own and allows them to be part of the kingdom. He, things are going good, and everybody's like, this is the guy. This is the kingdom that's going to be established forever. David's the man. And then it says in chapter 11, verse 1, when kings went to war in the spring, David stayed home. Now, many pastors and preachers, if you've listened to this, say, well, if David had not gone to war, then he wouldn't have looked at Bathsheba and everything would be fine. I don't think that's true. It's just saying David didn't get to war. Who knows? Maybe he had a cold. I don't know. Like, I, I, let's give David the benefit of the doubt. What we do know is he gets up in the evening or in the morning, one, or one evening, uh, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of a palace and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. The text goes on to say that he calls her, finds out she's married, sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, and then for a year tries to keep it all secret, basically. Or at least he also kills her husband. So, like, it's, it's, it's just, it goes from everything is really good to one impulsive act by David and everything starts going bad, right? Every single thing goes bad. In fact... By the end of it all, David's really just half the man he was. Um, and his kingdom has fallen apart, and his, he's, he spent half of the, that of his life on the run. Um, but here's the amazing scene. Why is David different? Why was God willing to keep David be the, in the line? Like, why is his kingdom going to last forever and not Saul's? It's because when David is confronted with his sin, David repents. So Nathan the prophet comes to David and he tells this, this parable. He says, hey, like there's this guy and he has this special little sheep and that family loves the sheep and it's a family pet. And the neighbor, well, he's got flock after flock and he's rich and he's wealthy and he's having a guest and, they, and he wants to cook them a lamb. And so he goes to his next door neighbor and he steals the neighbor's precious pet and kills it and serves it to his guest. And of course, David's like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. We should kill this guy. It's the worst ever. Who would ever do something impulsive, right? This is impulsive. Like, it's the worst thing immediately. We're going to kill him. And then Nathan says, well, it's you. You're the one doing it. And that moment, David realizes and David repents. And David writes many psalms out of this, but he writes this particular one, Psalm 51, which we sing here at the village. I'll read the first two lines. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And he goes on to say, it's, I haven't sinned against anybody but you. And the reason he's saying that is, is he's saying, I have violated the image of this woman this man, like I have violated your image in them. And so I have sinned against you ultimately because I have disrespected what you love. Right? And so he, and, and the other thing he says in Psalm 66, 18, he says, I didn't cherish my sin. Like I didn't water it. I didn't keep it. When I was confronted with it, I just got rid of it. Right? And this is why God says, David has a heart after me. It's because he doesn't cherish his sin. He, he, when, has, when he's confronted with the sin as a monster, he attacks it. Now, I was talking while I was working on this sermon um, on, and just kind of practicing it, and the cleaners of the village, village, some of the volunteers came. One of them is actually one of the more renowned um, theologians of the village, and his name is Philip Sonnets. And it, he's uh, sitting right there in the purple shirt. We'll embarrass him a little bit. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm so excited about Samuel because this is my favorite book. And I just started asking him about it. And what he said was a lot of good stuff. But the one that like, just kind of caught my breath is that he would start talking about Saul at the end of his life. That Saul ends up in a place where Samuel is dead. They're going to war again with the Philistines. And he doesn't know what to do. And so he's going to go talk to God. 
And it says, The Philistines assembled and came to set up camp at Shuman, and Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. See, there it is. He is the, he's controlled by his fear. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or ermine or prophets. So the ermine is just a priest and how a priest would make a decision about what God is saying. So the priests don't say anything. The prophets don't say anything. He hears nothing in his dreams. Saul is alone with no voice of God. And Philip said, I am so glad that that is not where I am. That's, that's powerful. But why, why is Philip, and why if you are where Philip is with Jesus, are not in that place where you can go inquire of the Lord and he will answer you? Like, how do you get to that place? Why is that? Because Saul, when he can't hear God, decides to go to a medium. And I don't know how the medium does it, but it wakes up Samuel. And Samuel's not very happy about being woken up. And Samuel basically tells him how it is and that he's going to die and loses the kingdom and it's really miserable for him. Doesn't really, and then Saul dies and he gets beheaded. But there's this silence of God. Here's the thing. I know some of us sometimes think that God is silent. But if you are a follower of Jesus and you have been given the Spirit of God, you, God is not silent. So if you jump forward into the New Testament, after Jesus has risen from the dead and ascends into heaven, the disciples, 120 of them, are told to go to this room and wait for the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit of God. Now here's the unique thing about this. The Spirit of God was on Samuel. The Spirit of God was on Saul. The Spirit of God was on David. This is how it works in the Old Testament. The leaders have the Spirit of God. These Men and women in the New Testament, after Jesus has died and risen from the dead, are told to wait for the Spirit of God, okay? The Spirit of God falls on them, and they begin to speak in different languages. And people, it's so loud, 120 people speak in different languages, and they, the people are wandering around, they hear it, they hear their own language, they hear about Jesus in their own language, and they're like, are these people drunk? And Peter stands up and said, no, it's only nine in the morning, guys. So I think drinking was a big part of the, of the culture. Like, hey, nine in the morning, guys, we're not drunk. You know, maybe if it were five, we would all be plastered and it's probably not the Holy Spirit. But it's nine in the morning. And this is when the church begins. Well, here's the interesting thing. You jump forward two chapters. You find John and Peter standing in front of the Sanhedrin. These are the people who crucified Jesus, who put him to death. Listen to their reflection on Peter and John. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. Now, you see, they were looking at who they were on the outside. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Here's the crazy thing is that you and I, there is no silence because of Jesus. When you and I long for a word from God, an engagement with God, we can walk boldly into the throne room and say, God, I am anxious on these things. And God will not be silent. But here's the thing. As you wrestle with pride and the way that it is destroying your life, pride can only be removed if you're going to be with Jesus. If you're longing to be humble, but humility is a difficult thing for you and it's causing a lot of problems in your life, the only way to walk away from it is to be with Jesus. Jesus. If you don't want your story to be the thing that's driving everything, you have to be with Jesus. Because the only way that you are going to defeat sin crouching at the door that wants to, and I always use the phrase, devour you, the only way to rule over it is to be with the one who defeated it. Because you can't rule over it. It will take you over. Right? It will take you over. Samuel, the book, is not for us to look at the characters and say, I want to be like them. Samuel, the book, is to point us towards Jesus and the need for Jesus. But also, we are shown characters where we can say, yeah, I am like Samuel. I am, you know, I'm the obedient kid. I follow God, but I do judge everybody. 
right? Or some of you can say, man, I am Saul. Like, I am just rattled with fear and have a difficulty hearing God. That's who I am. Or I'm David. Like, I, I can do the right things, and I love God, and I'm emotional about it, but I'm also impulsive. I can't control it. And the only way that I'm going to deal with these things, my Saul, my David, my Samuel, is to be with Jesus, to engage Jesus. So, since that's 58 chapters, here's, here's my encouragement to you. Read the book. <laughs> now you know a little bit of what to look for. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you uh, for this community. Thank you for the opportunity to walk through the Old Testament. I just ask that you would bless our conversation and bless the food as it is being prepared for us. Bless your body and your blood poured out for us. I ask that in your holy name. Amen.